that man has the right to work, but none of us have the right to rob others of the fruits of their work. We do not have the right to turn other people into sacrificial, rightless animals laboring to fulfill our needs. Now, some of you may ask here, but can people afford health care on their own? And even leaving aside the present government inflated medical prices, the answer is certainly people can afford it. Where do you think the money is coming from right now to pay for it all? Where does the government get its fabled unlimited money? Government is not a productive organization. It has no source of wealth other than confiscation of the citizen's wealth through taxation, deficit financing, or the like. <laughs> but you may say, isn't it the rich who are really paying the cost of medical care now? The rich, not the broad bulk of the people. It has been proved time and again that there are not enough rich anywhere to make a dent in the government's costs. It's the vast middle class in the United States that is the only source of the kind of money that national programs like government health care require. A simple example of this is the fact that the Clinton administration's new program rests squarely not on the backs of big business but of small businessmen who are struggling in, in today's economy merely to stay alive and in existence. Under any socialized program, it is the so-called little people who do most of the paying for it. And they do it under the senseless pretext that they, the people, can't afford it, so the government must take over. If the people of a country truly couldn't afford a certain service, for example, in Somalia they can't, neither for that very reason could any government in that country afford it either. Now, some people can't afford medical care in the United States, that's true. But they are necessarily a small minority in a free or even a semi-free country. If they were the majority, the country would be an utter bankrupt and could not even think of a national medical program. As to this small minority in a free country, they have only one recourse. They have to rely on private, voluntary charity. Yes, charity. <laughs> In other words, the kindness of the doctors or the, of the better off. Charity, not right. In other words, not their right to the lives or work of others. And such charity, I may say, was always forthcoming in the past in America. The advocates of Medicaid and Medicare under LBJ did not claim, if you go back to the 60s, that the poor or the old got bad care. They claimed that it was an affront and an outrage for anyone to have to depend on charity. Now the fact is you do not abolish charity by calling it something else. If a person is getting health care... <coughs> If a person is getting health care for nothing simply because he is breathing, he is still getting charity, whether or not President Clinton calls it a right. To call it a right when the recipient did nothing to earn it is merely to compound the evil. It is still charity, although now extorted by the criminal tactic of force and hiding under a dishonest name. <clears throat> As with any good or service that is provided by some specific group of men, if you try to make its possession by everyone a right, you thereby enslave the providers of the service, wreck the service, and end up depriving the very consumers you're supposed to be helping. To call medical care a right will merely enslave the doctors and thus destroy the quality of medical care in this country, as socialized medicine has done around the world wherever it has been tried, including Canada, where I'm originally from. Can I take just a minute to clarify one point here? <coughs> About why and how socialized medicine enslaves the doctors. I want to quote from an article I wrote a few years ago called Medicine, the Death of a Profession. In medicine, above all, the mind must be left free. 
Medical treatment involves countless variables and options that must be taken into account, weighed and summed up by the doctor's mind and subconscious. Your life depends on the private inner essence of the doctor's function. It depends on the input that enters his brain and on the processing such input receives from him. What is being thrust now into the equation? It is not only objective medical facts any longer. Today, in one form or another, and I was writing a few years ago, the following also has to enter that brain. <clears throat> the DRG administrator, in other words, the hospital or the HMO man trying to control costs. This is what the doctor has to think. This guy is going to raise hell if I operate. But the malpractice attorney down the street will have a field day if I don't. And my rival down the street, who heads the local PRO, the peer review board, favors a CAT scan in these cases. I can't afford to antagonize them. But the CON boys, the Certificate of Need boys, disagree, and they won't authorize a CAT scanner for our hospital. And besides, the FDA prohibits the drug I should be prescribing, <coughs> even though it's widely used in Europe. And the IRS might not allow the patient a tax deduction for it anyhow. And I can't get a specialist advice because the latest Medicare rules prohibit a consultation with this diagnosis. And maybe I shouldn't even take this patient, he's so sick. <coughs> After all, some doctors are manipulating their slate of patients. They accept only the healthiest ones. So their average costs are coming in lower than mine. And what's going to happen to my staff privileges? <coughs> Would you like your case to be treated this way by a doctor who takes into account your objective medical needs and the contradictory unintelligible demands of some 90 different <coughs> state and federal government agencies, which is what there are? If you were a doctor, could you comply with all of it? Could you plan or work around or deal with the unknowable? But how could you not? Those agencies are real and they are rapidly gaining total power over you and your mind and your patience. In this kind of nightmare world, if and when it takes hold, fully thought is helpless. No one can decide by rational means what to do. A doctor either obeys the loudest authority or he tries to sneak by unnoticed bootlegging some good health care occasionally or as so many of them are doing today, he simply gives up and quits the field. <clears throat> the Clinton plan will finish off quality medicine in this country because it will finish off the medical profession. It will deliver the doctors bound hands and feet to the mercies of the bureaucracy. The only hope, and I'm, I'm at an end, for the doctors, for their patients, and for all of us, is for the doctors to assert a moral principle. I mean to assert their own personal individual rights, their real rights in this issue. Their right to their own lives, liberty, property, and their pursuit of happiness. The Declaration of Independence applies to the medical profession, too. <clears throat> the, the battle against the Clinton plan, in my opinion, depends on the doctors speaking out against the plan, but not only on practical grounds. First of all, on moral grounds. The doctors must defend themselves and their own interest as a matter of solemn justice, upholding a moral principle, the first moral principle, self-preservation. If they can do it, all of us still have a chance. I hope it's not too late. Thank you for listening.